We are really blessed to have you here. Thanks. It's so good to be here. And I, I really love this, this uh, context and what NDF is doing around the world, talking about you know, the future of, of medical mission. So for full disclosure, uh, NDF has worked with uh, Dirk and EMI on several projects over a number of years. Uh, they are great and trusted partners, but Dirk, let's start. What are the basics? Tell us, tell all those other folks out there, what is EMI and what do you do and how do you do it? Great question. Thanks, Andy. So uh, EMI is a nonprofit Christian development organization with a network of staff and intern and, and volunteer architects, engineers, surveyors, construction managers. And our mission is to develop people to design structures, to construct facilities, to serve communities in the global church. So our vision is to see people that are restored by God and that the world is restored through design. So we use our skills to come alongside international ministry partners to work with uh, within our local context to design culturally appropriate facilities that are sustainable, uh, affordable, transformational. Uh, we have close to about Plus of 150 staff in 10 offices serving regions around the world, uh, in addition to our international network of nearly about 10,000 designers that share our mission. 150 staff. Wow. So explain to me how do you, so you do a lot with teams, right? And you organize that, you got volunteers. How, how does a project sort of typically go? Sure. Great question. Well, um, so let me start with how they begin. So somebody as, as famous as Annie Mayo reaches out to us and uh, typically just inquires uh, about a project and, and, and that initiates our vetting process. And um, so we kind of decide on mutual compatibility and, um, and, and be able to, once we do that, we were able to determine the course of our project. And so, um, you know, prior to the recent restrictions, we would then identify a, a, a time frame for when our a, a team could travel to that local facility or, or, or a proposed uh, undeveloped site. And it's usually um, about two or three months ahead of time. Uh, and then we would, uh, uh, that would actually set in motion several pieces. So one is that we would begin recruiting our team. And the teams are usually about, I don't know, eight to 12 or so designers depending on the complexity of the project. And uh, the teams themselves are a blend of staff and interns and, and, and volunteers that are either, that are both expatriated, as well as uh, we, we look to fill our team with local and or national architects, engineers, and the like, you know, that, 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 that really the spirit brings all together. Um, nowadays, we're, we're taking advantage of that advanced time to discuss a lot of questionnaires remotely uh, kind of pre-trip evaluation pieces, um, which normally we would have done first thing upon arrival, but that lets us kind of hit the ground running more effectively. So our team is most often on location for, I don't know, six to 10 days or so, a robust dialogue, um, scurrying around with intensive investigation, uh, and a lot of late nights with pencils and markers and fun things like that. Uh, we conclude with the presentation, kind of summarizing our findings in a design direction. Then we return to our offices and uh, produce a report and some conceptual design drawings within the following uh, two to four months. Again, kind of depending on the complexity. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to miss that mentioning that here in the short term, we've we've calibrated and our process, you know, by connecting remotely as much as possible, so we're not we're not completely shut down. Um, however, you know, there, there's nothing like seeing or experiencing and interacting, um, you know, with the, the, the proximate site, the staff, the patients, the team members, how the wind blows, local merit materials and those kind of pieces, particularly with our trained eyes and our ears. And so we look forward to traveling once again, that's for sure. You know, my experience, uh, the last experience I had was uh, with you all was in, at the end of your trip in Malawi. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I saw there was you had a multidisciplinary team that when you right. hit the ground, you're like a bunch of ants, you know, you just boom out. Uh, everybody's got their little piece, you know, whether it's an electrical guy or you know, everybody is out sort of 
stick in their nose in everything that's going on. And then coming back, you know, so every evening you get back together, you have a lot of the next day, boom, everybody's out, same thing. And right. It's, played, uh, it's a it's sort of a wonderful dance to see you all uh, sort of looking under the covers and, and coming back together. And in the presentation sort of is the summary of that with the final product to come later. So it's like boot camp. Uh, in six to ten days, and then uh, uh, going on from there. Yeah, I actually think it's more like special ops, if you like to say it that way. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it is. You know, you guys have the helmets, and you know. yeah. so give me, give us, give us all an example of five or six medical and non-medical. I guess, I guess I'm jealous. You know, it's like we should be doing all medical. And not non non medical, but I guess you do do other things. So give us an example of things that we've got on the board and the way part of right now. Sure. Well, you know, really EMI, we we, we offer a really a wide array of services. So it's just really hard to give one example. Um, you know, though we're discussing healthcare here, we, we certainly connect with seminaries and universities and training centers and schools and children's homes. The list goes on. Um, certainly the common denominator is, is, is honoring Christ in how we do and who we engage with as they are uh, all partners in, in ministry around the world. Um, it's been fun to experience the breadth and creativity that missions has taken you know, to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Um, we also engage with disaster response teams as technical experts. Um, we've trained um, local engineers to assess around 700 existing emergency shelters around Haiti. That's underway right now. Um, we've managed campus-wide electrical retrofits with solar installation and training uh, of their maintenance teams. Uh, we're even overseeing the construction of an MAF air landing field on the side of a, a mountain in Southeast Asia. So, you know, we, we do a vast variety of things. And again, we're architects and engineers, surveyors and construction managers. So we kind of try to really, as you said, multidisciplinary, but we really try to encompass a lot of those pieces. And you know, I could go on to, to, to wash systems, to water uh, sanitation and health systems and all, all those kind of pieces. So our medical projects include um, campus master planning. Uh, as you mentioned, your time in Malawi, that was a big part of that one in Oklahoma Hospital. And, and every, you know, and, and renovations, and new construction, I just returned from a facility in Kenya where we were designing a multi-phase, multi-level, 17,000 square meter complex. By the way, that's really big. <laughs> um, and you know, that, that would like include surgical expansion and relocation of a uh, maternity child health system and a whole new pediatric wing, all within one system, uh, in addition to the infrastructure to support it. So, as we were designing all the engineers were running around as well, as you mentioned. So, you know, we've, we've also been engaged with, with quite a number of uh, COVID retrofits this year too. So those are some good examples. Well, I know where one of the places that you've been really valuable to our part is just on the, even the concept of a master. Uh, we, what we were finding is, oh, well, we need this this year. And then the next year, well, we need this, but we got to tear that down. And there was no, okay, here's the master campus plan, and we're going to do this over a period of time, but it all fits as opposed to, you know, all sort of being pasted together on top of each other. Um, and many times the hospitals I've worked at in the United States haven't done a good job of that. So uh, <laughs> it's... It's a, it's always a process. It's always a, a, a challenge uh, in healthcare. So let's talk about um, hospital and healthcare design more specifically. Um, isn't isn't a hospital just a bunch of concrete blocks that you can just start throwing up and put together like any other building? <laughs> yeah, just like cars are a hunk of metal with wheels, right? <laughs> That's all it is. I prefer um, the kind of the Tesla. That yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you know, actually the functions of a hospital are, are quite a bit different than virtually all other than any other type of building process. So, 
to me, that's what makes more puzzles a lot more fun. So, um, so take for example something as simple as hand washing and bed spacing. Um, you know, because of COVID, all of us now for the last six months suddenly have begun to understand how critical it is that every healthcare worker has to clean their hands between patients. You know, and they're and therefore safe have to be developed and adequately serviced, you know, supplied and removed. Um, or or spacing be between beds not only improves access for healthcare or for care, um, you know, by workers, but but addresses infection control as well. And so Therefore, if a facility is designed inappropriately, uh, as perhaps we've been seeing, especially recently, uh, consequences can be dire or fatal. So, you know, those are just a few small examples of how you have to intentionally design a hospital building, more complex, really, as you mentioned, you know, around specific best practices that must go on inside of it. And I would also say around it as well, the surrounding and everything that's applied. So everything from airflow to water, sewage, electrical infrastructure, patient flow, staff, supply, visitor movements, all, all those kind of pieces are all kind of in, in a mesh. And the tremendous challenge we face is sifting through healthcare design standards that, that, that vary around the world and are often compromised in majority world settings, which is where our experience can fit in applying them within the local setting. One other example that even many experienced doctors and nurses might not be as familiar with is the design of, of how an OR works. So we have to design the full theater suites so that the clean, sterile staff and supplies you know, enter at one end and then are processed out the other end once they're used and dirty. So it's essential that, you know, that, that it has to function as a linear path. So that dirty instruments don't have a chance of, of, of crossing or coming anywhere and you're affecting the clean instruments of another patient. So it's even more complicated than it sounds, <laughs> but uh, particularly in, in spaces when mission facilities are, well, let's just say not as generous as we find here. And um, you know, over the years of our experience, we've learned where a poorly designed system can actually cause more harm than it does good. A lot of that has come, I mean, if you look at healthcare as an industry, so let's, you know, you won't necessarily point fingers, but you'll say, okay, well, where did this come from? It came from years and years and years of experience and work and findings of, oh, never occurred to me right. when, when you do this, that this happened. Um, I saw a one one of the countries I, I saw a uh, operating theater suite that had been built. Um, I think it was some number of containers that were sent over and put together, but they really hadn't thought through that process that you were talking about. So in essence, the when dirty stuff came out of the OR and was going heading for sterilization, it crossed right across the middle. You know, they had to carry it literally through the middle of the OR. And so then it got, you know, and then it went back through the middle of the OR, through this suite, the, you know, big space. So essentially you have dirty and clean crossing the path of each other all day long. Well, unless you've been in the healthcare industry and begin to think, oh, when you're carrying stuff from a patient who was possibly infected, you don't want that crossing over. Um, and, you know, I've seen many different occasions, of, you know, different examples of things like that where people just weren't thinking uh, yeah. about the outcomes. Um, sure. So it's, you know, it's, it's all about learning. It's all about putting together our experience and putting that into a best practice and moving forward. And if I could add also that, uh, you know, I think there's also a part of, of uh, um, uh, uh, accountability that does happen, uh, particularly here in the States, if you will, um, whether it's, it's uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, health department coming in or, or uh, fear of, you know, litigious issues. And so, and yet other places have been compromised and, and uh, where there, there isn't nearly the same kind of accountability. And so, Things get compromised and fudged a little bit, and I think that has happened um, aggregately. That's for sure. Well, historically, we've 
as good Americans, we've tended to get on a plane and head off. And we we leave, leave behind what we know are the best practices. And right. That's good enough. Um, so, you know, now I'm putting my mission team hat on. This sounds really expensive. Can't we just go and hire the local guy and just get it done? You know, it's sort of do good enough job. Well, you know, I, I, I want to answer that in two different ways. Um, in one way, I, I, I don't want to bring any uh, deference at all to the local professional. And actually, I want to return to that. Um, but I, I also want to be in 100, I, I, I think you're 100% agreement with this. We, we, we can no longer be in a position to bring um, an inferior or a compromised approach and product really to any of our Christian ministry. You now we as Christians, of course, are to be characterized by excellence and true compassionate care. Um, you know, that, that typifies our mission to hospitals and everything. And in this case, including our facilities. So knowing and integrating critical standards is vital. Uh, as we're finding more and more countries are raising their own compliance requirements. At the same time, we also want to prioritize collaborating with, with local designers for contextual building practices. So simply importing our ideas or products, which I kind of call container missions, um, can be just paternalistic and you know can be ineffective as, as we've seen. At the same time, you know, I, I really think the blend is critical. I don't want to presume that, that the knowledge isn't established locally, and yet being able to blend it is 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 is, is a wonderful piece. And so in many ways, our, we, this is just kind of a bottom line that, that if your project is not going to meet internationally accepted health design standards, nor is tenable for the long term in process or care, then please reconsider the project or allow us to come alongside you to creatively address your needs. And by the way, our services are certainly more reasonable than, than you might be presuming. So, you know, that drives the hearts of our ministry. That's why we're doing it. We don't want to advertise it too much. I like sort of having a franchise on you, you know, it's a, it's a good thing. Well, a, a great example of that is we were working on a project in Kenya and uh, the local architect had done some work on it. And uh, Jimmy Height, uh, who's an architect, who used a number of years on our board, just one of the greatest guys ever, I asked him to take a quick look and he looked at, these were things that just came out of, you know, just off the top of his head. As he looked at the restrooms, sure. he said, well, th those aren't ADA compliant. They haven't thought about sure. things like the door is wide enough for a wheelchair to go through. Sure. Sure. So that's a simple little thing. Right. And it's not like we're exporting, you know, our standards, you think, Oh, it is. You, you do have to accommodate people who are handicapped and you want them to be able to, to uh, use the restroom. Right. So, and he didn't, it was just like it was building, hardwired into him, you know, da, 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 he looked at it, he could point it, you know, immediately his finger went to that. So, you know, one of the topics that we're, we're, we're covering every single week is the change that's coming over the next 10 to 20 years. So what do you think about when you're thinking about in 10 or 20 years, what's gonna be needed, what's gonna to have to happen? What are the greatest things that are at the top of your list? Sure. So uh, let, let's begin with some things that might, have been, might be uh, changing recently. Um, we are definitely seeing a shift in, in expectations in healthcare. Uh, for example, uh, staff to patient ratios are diminishing, uh, and and that's that that's impacting in patient in patient design. So you know the open ward system is 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 shifting to clusters of four to six bed semi private pods, um, and and even introducing more private and, and isolation rooms in that case. Um, you know, this, this this can improve in patient care and infection control, as we talked about. Yeah, it's not just they have a big ward with COVID nineteen. You're right. <laughs> no, well, they, we're, we've been trying. Um, you know, but but you know that that impacts building footprints. Uh, can it not? And and 
and really, of course, the supporting services to that as well. Um, it, it influences, you know, the staffing and the training. Uh, Patrick, you mentioned about the nursing schools that MDF is part of. I mean, that, that's a huge piece of it. And as we connect with with uh, surgical training groups and and others, you know, that, that 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 has a great impact in that. So, you know, we we continue to see escalation of local capacity building. Um, like I said, from nurses to surgeons to and, and I would want to insert that I think it's critical that we're, we're also training facility maintenance staff as well. And I'll kind of, kind of come back to that. that. That'll be a recurring thing. As much as the care is set, you know, the outward care is so critical, much of our conversation is, is the facilities and the maintenance as well that we can't forget. So, you know, the, the, the recent challenge with COVID, you know, we faced it with Ebola, you know, five or so years ago. Um, it, it, it's challenged us to think about circulation processes, everything from intake to internal movement within the, con the, the whole complex, and, and of course the outflows. So, you know, that reminds me just how vital our, our full campus master planning is, um, you know, as, as we consider uh, future development. Um, now, thirdly, I, I, I got to mention the vanguard role of, of technology integration um, in everything from electric, electronic medical records uh, to equipment in wards and operating theaters, even mechanical systems. Um, you know, even redistributed uh, equipment has opened pathways into new services, which is great, you know, like diagnostics and dialysis and oncological treatment. You know, I, to even say, MRI five years ago was just outrageous, um, but now it's it's part of the conversation. So, but at that same time, you know, growth in those kind of places it, it creates heavy demand on on utility infrastructure uh, of training, of uh, maintenance, of replacement support, and, and we can't overlook that. So, um, the the technology is is with us, just like our our, our phones are with us. Um, but you know we can't keep dropping them in the toilet or the water, right? <laughs> so we have to make we have to keep them uh, uh, clearly maintained. So this leads me to one final thought: um, as we look ahead, you know we, we can't forego the foundation, um, supporting infrastructure, you know facilities and utilities. They can't be compromised or forgotten. Uh, social distancing is reminding us that that spacing matters, right? Um, so I would say space matters, um, facilities matter, power generation, water, they matter. Um, I'm going to close with just a simple adage from Plumbing. If you don't pay attention to what's supporting on the back end, don't add the water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then <done> there. <laughs> So guys, we are running short on time, but we do have uh, a question from our uh, uh, from one of our uh, viewers. Uh, they say that um, uh, their church has a long time commitment to missions and have been involved in several me medical projects, specifically facilities overseas. So, uh, Dirk, what would be your list of two or three most important things that they need to think about as requirements? going forward here in the future they they kind of admit that well maybe we didn't quite think through things in the past so what can we do uh to make sure that we're really uh, uh doing what god intends us to do and and what do we need to do is in terms of requirements for the future sure so um so in many ways i, I just addressed some of that so one is do not for forgo the foundation so I just mentioned, you know, facilities and utilities. They 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 must be planned, they must be developed, and they must be maintained critically. Um, you know, whether it's design standards on one end to operations and maintenance manuals on the other end, uh, it really needs to be the gamut. And if we forgo that, then then really things do fall apart. Um, second thing I would say, embrace the future. Uh, you know, crucial pieces like like the training and development that I mentioned, uh, local capacity building, because we, we just simply can't keep relying on, on, on overseas investments, if you will. Um, 
and really embracing ever increasing integration of technology. It's here with us. Um, for example, you know, the, 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 the continent of Africa just completely bypassed phone landmines and you know, immediately went to cell technology. It's with us. And so how that's going to be integrated, I think, is a critical piece. And thirdly, a, a, a commitment to long-term sustainability. So yes, of course, environmental, uh, that's, that, that, that's a piece to it, but, but really well beyond. You know, there, there's investment and, and financial stability, um, commitment to staffing, uh, again, infrastructure, and, and that piece of local integration so that, that things can be maintained and sustained. Uh, I, would, I would like also to add, you know, placing Christ first and the redemption of his people, and then the task, in this case, medicine. Um, at EMI, our, our core values are design, discipleship, and diversity. Uh, so we love to integrate that task, worship, and people piece. Um, and my last recommendation would, of course, to partner with EMI. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, you mentioned something, Dirk, that really hits a note with me. Um, and we've done this in a couple projects. It was too many times we get focused on, I want to buy this thing and solve that problem and then leave. And a couple of times people have really had problems with us where we've said, no, 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 you need a, this has got to be a five year plan right. that even though you're starting with this, you're, to your point, training, training people to support it. Okay. That you really have to have a five year plan Kind of keep it supported and maintained because it does no good to drop it off and leave. Uh, we've Absolutely. great example is a nursing school in Malawi that has all of this beautiful uh, equipment in their kitchen. Somebody bought them these big cookers, and it's two or three years later, still sitting there all brand new because the electrical capacity coming into the building. There wasn't enough electrical capacity to be able to run these things. Right. So the problem was solved. You know, the equipment arrived, but they can't use it. They're still out back cooking on chargeable fires, and this equipment sitting inside. So um, excellent, excellent recommendation. So for those those problems in the future, NBF and EMI together can help make sure that your medical ministry is well thought out and sustainable. Our special guest tonight has been uh, Dirk Anderson with EMI Engineering Ministries Inter International. Dirk, I want to thank you. Um, you mentioned that there, Andy mentioned that you have a zeal for architecture, but it's not just for architecture, it's for the work uh, to expand the kingdom. I want to thank you for that zeal as well, and thank you for joining us tonight. I do have done it. I do have be able to be part of this. Our next program is uh, Tuesday, August 18th. Andy, we've got another great program in store. What's on tap for that discussion? Ah, hard to top this one, but that one will be even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Lisa Alianello is the new director of the MBF Center for Global Nursing. And Lisa will be joining us to talk about what's new with the center. Uh, the projects that are going on, and um, some of the special things around nursing uh, in developing countries, and the developing countries we're working that I think you're going to want to hear uh, because it's um, really special. And nursing is critically important, especially right now as the nurses are um, really on the front lines and dealing with the COVID pandemic, and not only here in the United States, but across the globe. So we're looking forward to that conversation. And if you've missed one of our previous discussions on Medical Missions Live, you can get caught up by going to our website, medicalmission.org, and click on the Media and Resources tab. You can watch our recent discussions with doctor and missionary, Dr. Paul Osteen from Lakewood Church, and author and community advocate, Bob Lupton. And actually, in a, another week, you can go back and watch tonight's episode again, uh, in case you missed something that Dirk said medicalmission.org and click on the media and resources tab. No Friends, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and um, he said, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. 
So if you want to join NBF in focusing on God's ways and not the ways of the world, we ask you to consider two things. First of all, would you pray daily? Your NBF team begins each day in prayer together on a conference call. And we ask you that you join in that daily practice and, and choose one of our international partners or one of our international countries and just lift them up in prayer. And secondly, if your values align with what you know about NBF, what you're learning about us and how we're trying to foster sustainable medical ministries in these developing countries, if you want to be a part of that miracle that God is performing, we ask that when you go to our website, medicalmission.org, you click the Donate Now button at the top of the page. Every dollar that comes into NBF is multiplied by God, and it becomes $5 of services to the least and the lost. And we'd like to thank you in advance for your generosity. And we hope you'll join us again next time for Medical Missions Live on Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. Don't forget to enjoy, invite a friend to join you as well. Thank you for joining us tonight and for giving us the opportunity to serve alongside you in ministry. May God's grace and peace be with you.